Hello, my name is Carla and in this video I'm going to briefly introduce the concept of fair data. To do that, I would like to use the treasure chest analogy devised by Dr. Emma Ann Harris. If you think of data as a pressure treasure chest that you really want to obtain, the first thing that you need is some sort of help in finding it. Where is it? How can you reach it? So you need a map. But that is not enough. You also need to know what you have to do to get it. Are there any obstacles that you should be aware of? How can these obstacles be overcome? Once you get to the treasure chest, can you open it? Do you have the correct key? And finally, once you open it, what is what you find useful or is it just a bunch of old rusty coins when you wanted to find nice new euro banknotes? This illustrates very well what happens when you're looking for data. First, you need to know where the data is. It should be findable. And that location needs to have some sort of meaning for you. It's okay to know that someone has their data in their hard drive, but that is not going to help you if you cannot access them. And that takes us to accessibility. Are there any restrictions on obtaining such data? Are they in a closed repository or on someone's computer? Is there any specific permission you must obtain before you can access the data? So let us say you were able to find and access the data. Are you actually able to use them? Do they need specific software to be read or can you read it with something you have access to? In other words, is the data interoperable? Finally, let us say that all the previous steps worked perfectly. You found your data, were able to access them and read them. Are they reusable? Can you understand their meaning? Do they have a license? Is this license clear on what you are allowed to do with them and what is not? So the FAIR guidelines help you to ensure that your data become a treasure chest, not only for you, but also for your entire research community. And beyond. One important point is that FAIR data is not the same as open data and is not the same as ethical data. Specifically, the data can be open, but not FAIR. As I explained just now, it is not enough for the data to be out there. They also need to be usable and useful. Not all data can be open, obviously. Think about sensitive data, for example. In archaeology, position of sites or funerary data, depending on their context. There are legal aspects that are sometimes taken into consideration. Perhaps not in the case of phytolith data, but definitely with data that can potentially be reused for military or illegal activities. Therefore, data do not need to be open or fair at all costs. The principle to follow is to be as open as possible and as closed as needed. However, one important thing is that data should always be ethical. Therefore, aside from fair, the care principle should always be taken into consideration as well. A common misconception about FAIR principle is that it requires open data. It does not. The FAIR principle requires you to make the information about your data, so the metadata, openly available. This means that other researchers can understand what data was collected, what methods were used, where the data can be, or, uh, can be accessed, what standards and vocabularies have been used, and how the data can or could be reused. As you will see, in this and the next slides, the emphasis of FAIR is on metadata or how you describe your data rather than on data itself. The first step in reusing data is to find them, as we said. So metadata and data should be easy to find for both humans and computer. Machine-readable metadata are essential for the automatic discovery of datasets and services. Therefore, they are an essential component of the verification process. For example, Data and metadata should be published in a repository with a permanent digital object identification, or DOI.
Once the user finds the required data, they must know how they can be accessed, possibly including authentication and authorization. In open repositories, it's normally very easy to look at data so you can understand whether it is what you're interested in and in case, download it. Data usually needs to be integrated with other data. In addition, they must interoperate with application or workflow for analysis, storage and processing. Therefore, whenever possible, it is always best to use generic formats such as CSV for spreadsheets rather than XLS, such as the file can be used with open program. The ultimate goal of FAIR is to optimize the reuse of data. To achieve this, metadata and data should be well described so that they can be replicated and or combined in different settings. A clear example is the license and citation guides, which should always be clear and easy to consult. And talking about licenses, Another common misconception is the, that open or fair is free for all, but it's not. When you make your data open and fair, you do not give permission to just anybody to come get it and use it as if it was their own product. Unfortunately, we know that this sometimes occurs even in our community. In fact, making data fair reduces the risk of plagiarism as the data get a digital object identifier, which is a sort of stamp on when the data was produced and a license on how to use them. There are many available licenses and I guess everybody has heard of Creative Commons licenses, which have different characteristics. Most anyone uh, who used the data have to cite the person or persons who produced and made the data available. If this does not happen, you have the proof to call it out. So why do we need fair data for Phytolith community? In 2020, Emma Karun, whom you should have heard talking about open access, looked at a set of 16 archaeological and paleocolic ecological journals in a 10-year period from 2009 to 2018 and picked out all of the phytolith articles that contained primary data. In total, she looked at 341 articles. She then collected data on data format, reusability, inclusion of photos for identification, description of the method used, use of standard nomenclature, and whether the articles were open access. In terms of data, she found that 53% of, uh, of the article shared any data. This was any form of data, so it included article with at least one data table in the text, but also data in supplementary file or repositories. She then refined this to look more closely at the reusability of data. So this included full raw data and had to be in Excel spreadsheet, CSV file, or open repositories, which was only present in 4% of the articles. In all the articles that she looked at, only one had data in an open repository. Thus, this study shows a clear lack of data sharing, which hinders the progress of our community. And we hope to change this trend so that in the future, the whole community of Phytolith researchers and the scientific community at large could benefit, benefit from fair data. So what benefits can we obtain for verifying our data? For example, it increases the visibility and citation of research, it improves the reproducibility and reliability, it attracts potential collaborators, including researchers and policy makers from the same community and broader communities, and it encourages us to have better control on our data and methods, besides promoting new research questions. Thank you for listening and please connect with us on Slack, join, join our mailing list, take a look at our website or follow us on Twitter, on Facebook.